Thank you for coming to the uh, third in a series of lectures for the Design Forum. And uh, I would like to introduce to you Dean Noda, who's teaching in the second uh, year undergraduate program, who will introduce to tonight's speaker. Thank you. Um, when I think of Betty Edwards, I think of uh, an artist, an educator, a researcher, and I think as many of us know her as an author. She is currently professor of art at California State University, Long Beach. But her original contribution to the art of drawing and creativity have reached uh, far beyond the classroom and the studio. Her, her work has been praised by a distinguished range of art educators, psychologists, as well as artists and members of the professional design disciplines, architects being a part of that, I would say. Um, she has conducted seminars and workshops for the likes of IBM, General Electric, um, and research organizations throughout the United States and uh, Europe. In 1985, she founded the Center for Brain, I have to get this right, the Center for Educational Applications of Brain Hemisphere Research, uh, also known as the Brain Ed Center, um, at, also at California State University, Long Beach. The center encourages and promotes ways of teaching that put to use uh, new knowledge about how the brain works. Um, in her first book, Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain, published in 1979, she taught us that drawing is a skill that with a, dis a disciplined approach can really be learned by anyone. In fact, she has proposed that the probability of acquiring what would be referred to, what I would refer to as a, a visual literacy is um, approximately the same as the probability of learning to read and write. And I think she feels that they, the emphasis in our educational process should be uh, balanced in that direction as well. But for me, this book was not so much about drawing as it was about perception or learning about the special way that artists see, that an artist can see. In her second book, which I'm hopefully she's going to talk about more tonight, um, she extends the notion of drawing to the creative process itself. And I think that um, my personal attraction to the second book and to Betty's work in general is that it parallels my own thinking about the role of drawing in um, the creative processes that I try and use in my own practice of architecture and also in my teaching uh, here at SciArc. Uh, it's my understanding that her pattern of thought has formed the um, thesis for the formulation of this lecture series. And it's with my great pleasure that I introduce Betty Edwards. I'm very excited to be here tonight, and uh, uh, I'm happy that you all came in spite of the fact that this is the last of the baseball games. Thank you very much. <laughs> I think we'll start right in with the slides, please. Um, I, I'd, I'd like to start these lectures with a, an image of the old bean itself. I think it's really important that we recall, remind ourselves that there it sits in every skull in this room, working away, mostly out of control, I, <laughs> at least my own is. And, and really the major thesis that I'm going to present to you tonight is the idea that with current research on brain hemisphere function, we're at a point now where perhaps we can 
get the old bean under a little bit better control, produce perhaps a greater uh, degree of creative problem solving, uh, and um, take charge, so to speak. Now, brain hemisphere function is summarized in this uh, in this little chart. I, I should probably mention to you that in planning this lecture tonight, I decided that, that I, without question, you, all of you are aware of this research, I know, are aware of the use of it, are using it every day in your own work. And so what I'd like to do tonight is, is, uh, is really race through both books with you. The first hour of this lecture, I'm going to to run through the uh, really the work of the first book and the second with a couple of little exercises, and the second hour uh, to do the creativity exercises. So if I'm going a bit fast, uh, that's that's the reason for it. Uh, the chart that you see here, of course, is a summary of the knowledge that we now have that the two hemispheres of the human brain. Are, is this making an echo in the back? Sorry, it can, can you, is it the volume perhaps? Aha, uh -huh. anything I can do about that? <laughs> okay, sorry? Behind the podium is the right spot? Is that better? Well, we'll, I'll try to talk quietly then. Is that better? Oh, okay, maybe they can fiddle with it back there. Um, that, that this chart summarizes hemisphere function. Uh, we know now that the two brain halves are, are working with different styles of thinking. For most of the individuals in this room, left hemisphere, or what I've called L mode, mainly located in the left hemisphere, about 95% of human beings, uh, is working in a verbal, analytic, step-by-step, -step, symbolic, uh, linear uh, way. Uh, in, a, in that manner of thinking, things strung out in strings, da, 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 like words in a sentence or paragraphs in an essay. The other half of the brain is working in a much different style, much a fundamentally different way of responding to what's going out, what's going on out there in the world in front of you. So as I'm giving this lecture tonight, your L mode is processing the words, what I'm saying, the, what I hope to be the logical progression of ideas, uh, uh, the w rational, uh, uh, working out ideas rationally and so on. In the meantime, your R mode for most of uh, most human beings located in the right hemisphere is processing this event in a fundamentally different way. Visually, perceptually, watching the body language. You all know this from the uh, from the current debates that are going on. That we're watching the body language. We're responding to the slightest change in expression responding to the tone of voice, responding to this sort of global, very complicated set of visual perceptual information uh, processed not step by step, da, 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 but all at once, simultaneously as it occurs. Now, I think a point to remember, and certainly a point, uh, in your work at, uh, in, uh, as architects and designers, uh, the point is that if these two modes are in agreement with what's going on, the person feels comfortable, uh, feels no sense of incongruence. But if the two messages coming in are in conflict, and they can be. That is, the words that are said do not match with the visual perceptual information. Then the second mode of thinking, our mode, rises up to level of consciousness, and the person becomes uncomfortable. One becomes uncomfortable. Uh, I can tell you as a native Californian that this was Richard Nixon's problem from the beginning, 
that he could not get those two things to work together. This may be Dan Quayle's problem as well. We don't know, we don't know quite yet. If the two messages that are coming into your brain right now are in fact congruent, then when then Elmo dominates, listens to the words, the message is taken in. The other way of thinking is still going on, but it remains at a lower level of consciousness uh, since it's not at, in conflict with the original message. Now, this information is fairly widespread now. Um, it has gone into, into the language as a, uh, as a kind of, uh, let me see if I can get that a bit better, right. Uh, it has gone into the language as uh, a way of thinking, really. Um, this is uh, the so-called Star Trek model of brain management. And uh, th while this is clever, and I, I think rather amusing, was made up, it was invented or first uh, published by uh, uh, two authors uh, in management, actually, down in Georgia. Uh, but I think this is really wonderful, with this Star Trek model I'm using all the time now, uh, because it so well illustrates what is really going on in the brain. So Mr. Spock, it represents Elmo. You know that character, he's perfect for it. Dr. McCoy represents our mode. Unfortunately, uh, is presented as the weak, the weakest of this uh, group of characters. Where, uh, in fact, the evidence is pretty clear that our mode is extremely powerful, extremely rapid, and can process huge amounts of data all at once. Uh, Scotty and the crew are taking care of the nuts and bolts of the space voyage, and they're down there. Uh, representing the visceral brain, or the old brain. And Captain Kirk is the one who takes all this information, melds and reconciles it, and makes best judgment based on incoming information. Now, what I'm suggesting to you tonight is this model that uh, apparently the brain, according to some research, is capable of, of, uh, of, a, of a third entity, something like Captain Kirk, sometimes called the executive of the brain, sometimes called the hidden observer of the brain. But apparently, the human brain is, uh, is able to process an event one way, verbally, step by step, simultaneously a second way, visually, perceptually, globally, all at once. Um, and also, well, while all the automatic stuff is going on in the brain, and at the same time provide a kind of observer which is outside of self, so to speak, looking back at what's going on in the brain, which is, in fact, I think, mostly out of control. What this might do is to give us a, a bit better control over who picks up the job when it's appropriate, um, over whose information, who, so to speak, whose information uh, gets listened to. And the research is clear that L mode in the brain is aggressive and competitive. The language system dominates all of us about 90% of the time. The other system is very fragile, very often stays below level of consciousness, must be listened to deliberately. Captain Kirk's got to call on Dr. McCoy. What do you think? Uh, in order for that message to get up to level of consciousness. Uh, the architecture, architects and designers are in the interesting situation of needing both modes of thinking, working at very high level almost all the time. This means that you people have to double track. This is something that I personally have a lot of trouble doing. Architects must be able to keep the linear, analytic, digital 
uh, technological stuff going. At the same time, keep the overall global picture and all of the visual perceptual details going. All, this is a special brain. And I quite fancy that, uh, that your training addresses this problem and that the most successful architects, like Dean Nota, for example, uh, with his recent prize, I was so pleased to hear about that, uh, his, uh, the uh, citation award, that, uh, that it's these people who are, are able to keep these two um, ways of thinking both melded and separate and both at level, up to level of consciousness. Now, also in the culture, you see these ads, they're all over the place now, meaning that two ways of thinking are coming are becoming quite commonly known. Another example, left brain, right brain, they put the pictures on the right side, they put the words and numbers on the, uh, the I, I, I mean the, the correct side for the contralateral side for pictures for the right hemisphere crossover and the words and numbers for the left hemisphere. They're doing their research and they've got it right. The cartoonists are doing this as well. The woman in the bar is saying, the right side of my brain says yes, but I'm waiting to hear from the left side of my brain. And again, the cartoonist has, has got the research right. A recent cover of Business Week magazine um, touches on the importance of, especially the right hemisphere of the brain, in creativity. Creativity out in the business world is a very hot subject. Uh, businesses are uh, searching for ways to improve creative problem solving. This is faced with new challenges from overseas, from cultures whose mental patterns are different from our culture, which is scientific, technological, verbal, and L mode. Other cultures, particularly uh, Eastern cultures, often have better, easier access to R mode or visual perceptual processes. Now, it isn't that they are more creative than we are. This is especially in the case of Japan, although uh, I should add that the government of Japan is now pouring very large amounts of money into creativity research. They want to increase this, and there's no question but that they will, particularly with the, the double language situation in Japan, which uses both halves of the brain, as perhaps some of you are aware. Some characteristics of creativity, this great uh, grail that, we, that uh, uh, is, is in, in our culture right now, these are aspects of creativity which are uh, well known, certainly. They're very positive aspects. Uh, they have to do with, they point the way to the involvement. Any way we can stop this? How long is it? Long is it? They point the way to the involvement of the visual perceptual system in seeing problems. We always talk about now I see the picture of uh, trying to gain a new perspective or gain an insight, uh, which I think is a very significant word. The root of intuition itself refers back to the verbal system. So this notion that, that seeing or the, the processes that go on in the right hemisphere of the brain that they are deeply involved in creative problem solving is really embedded in creativity itself. I, should, I would like at this point just to point out some aspects of creativity. I don't have a slide on this, but this comes from a, a, a Jungian psychologist, uh, Silvano Arietti, who points out that in addition to all these good things about creativity, curiosity, openness, uh, um, the questing mind, and all of those positive things, that there are some negative aspects of creativity. 
which I'm sure you all are very familiar with. The Arietti points out that in order to do creative problem solving, it is necessary often to be alone. Creative problem solving usually goes on in the single brain. Uh, brainstorming has really not worked out that well. And the greatest insights have come from the individual working alone. Arietti reminds us that in order to be creative, one must let the mind wander. Just try this out on IBM. You know, they, they really are not interested in employees who, whose minds are wandering around. And yet, in order to see solutions to problems, it really is necessary for the person to always be looking around, to always be wondering about things with the wandering mind. The famous picture of the absent-minded professor is probably an accurate picture. Thirdly, Arietti reminds us that to be creative, one needs to be gullible. Again, the business world is not a place to be gullible, believe me. So this, is, this is a very hard thing to swallow, particularly for males in our culture, because to be creative, it is necessary to entertain ideas that are off the wall. The answers that everyone else thinks are really crazy. Maybe that's where the answer lies. So that, so that a person has got to always be gullible enough to consider unlikely solutions to problems. Um, and this is a trait that most of us are, are quite unwilling to acquire. I was so happy to read this because I personally have been accused all my life of being gullible, and I am. And it has caused me great embarrassment. And when I read Arietti and found this, I thought, oh, this is wonderful. And, but I also, it, is, it was said of, of, not to place myself in the same paragraph with a genius, but it has been said of Einstein that he was as gullible as a child. So I invite you to be gullible and to try things that that really you don't make much sense. And so I, I believe Arietti is right. Uh, finally, Arietti reminds us that to be creative requires what he calls remembrance. And specifically, what he means is remembrance of the traumas of one's past. This is very interesting. Because in our culture, we often feel that if you, you, if a person has problems, they should go to the therapist and talk it out and leave it and get on with your life. But Arietti says, no, don't do that. He said that the traumas of one's life form the rich ballast from which creative thought springs. I think it's a very interesting idea. Now, these are all, so quote, unattractive traits. Uh, but the history of creativity bears out Arietti's ideas because this is the, uh, these are the uh, characteristics that one finds in, often in creative people. Now, I, I'd like to stop at this point. We'll have the lights on. In your packet of materials, you've got a little pattern. These are, these are paintings by Jasper Johns, but I thought we'd try a little exercise may be familiar to some of you, but I think it's worth doing again, if you don't mind. In your packet, you've got a pattern that is the vase faces, and I believe that, uh, incidentally, I want to thank Bart for, uh, Miller for uh, put, uh, taking care of all of these materials. He's done such a beautiful job with all of it. You have in your packet this little pattern, and I would like to try this with you. Now, may I say that, uh, that the goodness or badness of your drawing is not at issue here, but uh, what is at issue is that you try for a moment to be Captain Kirk and to self-observe your own brain at work while you're doing this little exercise. So I want to give you the instructions and then we'll take a few minutes to do the drawing. Be 
so I'll finish the instructions before you start the drawing, okay? So this is it then. The pattern that you're, you're working with is the old base spaces pattern. And you are given half of the pattern. If, uh, how many left-handers do we have here tonight? They always sit on that side. It's so amazing, really. They do. This is wonderful. All right. Okay, if you're left-handed, you can. I think there's a left-hander in the packet, or you can just flop it and uh, work with the thing upside down so that you won't be covering the original drawing. So these are the instructions. On the drawing that's there, well, first let me say that your job is going to be to complete the second profile which will also inadvertently complete this symmetrical base in the center of the pattern. Before you start that, however, I'd like you to go back to the first profile, which is already drawn, and redraw the profile, naming the features as you go, like this. Forehead, nose, upper lip, lower lip, chin, and neck. And even go back and do that one more time, really thinking what those terms mean. Forehead, nose, upper lip, lower lip, chin, and neck. At that point, go to the other side and begin to draw the facing profile, which will complete this symmetrical base. When you get about here on the drawing, somewhere uh, uh, around the forehead, you may sense in your own mind some feeling of conflict or confusion. And I, uh, the purpose of this exercise is for you to self-observe how do you solve the problem. Okay, let's take a few minutes to do this now. Okay, it sounds as though most everyone is finished. If not, just keep on drawing. Okay, let me ask you now, how, how many of you did, in fact, feel some sense of confusion or conflict? Hands on that? No kidding, really. Uh, and let me ask you, did, any, did anyone in this audience feel paralysis? I mean, you've got to a point where you could not move one way or the other. Anyone here? Oh, really? No kidding, really. Can you tell, tell me about that? How did you solve that problem? What happened in the, in the back there? Yes. You just stopped, right? And, and was it, why? <laughs> he wanted to do it his way, he said. And were you able then to, did, was it a problem which way to go on the line? Uh -huh. How did you solve that? You just, and, but did you finish the drawing afterwards? Oh, no kidding, really. Oh, okay, let's hear from someone else who had paralysis. Yes, please. I'll just repeat that. He said that he heard himself saying the face parts, nose, chin, and so on, and that that confused him, so he just decided to stop thinking about that and... and to try to draw the negative image. And did that work for you? 
Okay, great. That's one of the solutions to the to the problem. Great. And the man just behind? Oh, you mean to go the same way? Uh, yes. Maybe some of the rest of you experienced that going the same. How did you solve that? Aha, uh -huh, right. And did that work for you? Okay, are you giving yourself some, is Captain Kirk in your brain giving you some instructions like don't think about a face or something like that? No, but you were able to continue and finish the drawing? Okay, good. There are numbers of solutions to this. Yes, in the back? Well, draw, did you draw grid lines on the drawing? Uh -huh. Right, drawing grid lines is a perfect solution. Did you feel it was cheating to do that? <laughs> well, I'm here to tell you that the right hemisphere is, it's the left hemisphere that keeps rules for us and that feeds back to us, well, you can't do that, that's cheating. The right hemisphere has no rules whatsoever. It's like Harpo Marx swinging from the chandelier, so anything that works. So gridding is great. Did, how many of you did grid the drawing to make grid marks to? Okay, great, that's a great solution. So the answer to your question is yes, do it. Anyone else have, yes, please. Uh -huh. Okay, another of the solutions, this woman said that that she started to draw a face, could not do that, and then made a conscious decision to draw the vase. And she could, anyone else switch from the, okay, this is another of the solutions, of course. Now, I, I'll tell you now what the trick is of this drawing. It's a wonderful, if you're doing any teaching, it's a very interesting exercise because what it demonstrates is the possibility for conflict between these two systems, and to these two systems of thinking. And that conflict can be so great that it actually results in paralysis. Those of you who are teaching, of course, um, very likely know this, that, that if instruction is entirely given in a verbal manner, but the task that's required of the students is entirely visual and perceptual, often that student is in a state of paralysis, cannot make that shift over, so that the instruction should better perhaps match with what the student is expected to do. So the trick of this, of course, is that in giving you these instructions, I, I plug in very strongly the names and left brain names and categories of the features and I emphasize that, and then I give you a job, I suggest to you a task that can only be done visually, perceptually, relationally, that's what the gridding is about, and so on. And many individuals, uh, whether trained in visual fields or say among business groups, really uh, uh, have to stop reprogram their own brains, do that Captain Kurt thing before they can proceed with the problem. And it does illustrate this, uh, the possibility of conflict between these two systems. Okay, any other questions on that little exercise then? Okay, I, how many of you were surprised at the degree of conflict that was there? Can I see hands on that? Because this is very interesting. To me. Yes, that's, that's uh, uh, probably well over half. The degree of conflict, our job of course, uh, let me say it this way, that conflict is out of control. Uh, we don't decide to be conflicted, the brain gets conflicted. So it is then up to this third entity, which we'll call Captain Kirk, to solve that problem. And in essence, that's what most of you did. You said, don't think of face or 
think of these, or shift to grid the lines and look for the points come together, and so on. Yes, question? Well, I don't, I, did I mention conflict? That you may, I said you may feel some uh, uh, confusion at that point, right. Well, this, that bit of instruction, I think, is, uh, the, is, is the attempt to alert you to self-observe your own brain. Otherwise, it is not at level of consciousness. But I, I take your point. That, it's, uh, that that is a power of suggestion. But believe me, the conflict would be there, but worse, probably, if I had not said it. Because you'd think that only you were having conflict and confusion. Okay, if we could have the lights down, then I'll proceed. How did this get sidewise? So sorry about that. Oh, I know why. I was marking the slide. Anyway, we can get that upright. I'll go back. Sorry about that. Good, thank you. Great, have you? Okay, I, I want next to show you a set of slides that demonstrate the teaching that, that uh, I've been doing along with my colleagues. Dean Notice wife, Linda Jo Russell, is work, has been working with me for, I think, 10 years now down at Cal State Long Beach. We have a group of of uh, four teachers and our office staff. This slide, as you can see, goes back to 1974. I've kept it for several, well, first of all, it was the first before and after set of drawings I ever kept. This boy was 19 years old, a carpentry student. What you see in this slide, well, let me show you the second slide uh, that this student did one year later. Uh, and one of the reasons I've kept this is that the model is the same. This girl is the same girl <laughs> who posed for him the year before. So it's a very interesting slide from that standpoint. Uh, now, if you look at this drawing, what you see here is an L mode symbolic answer to the problem of drawing. The model stands out there and the person who's going to draw her says, right, um, uh, we'll start with the eyes. He's sort of talking to himself, perhaps. Uh, and we'll use what we've always used for eyes. Next, we'll do the nose. Next, we'll, I'll do the mouth. And we'll use the mouth we've always used, and so on. Right down through all these little symbols. You'll notice that he has noticed that this girl has long hair. So he does long hair, but it's a little bit curly, so he does a little bit curly over here. Now, in the difference between this drawing and this drawing is really a difference of complexity. Uh, right hemisphere is able to um, uh, handle complexity of apparently unlimited quantity. The left hemisphere, some interesting new research has shown has a top limit in terms of complexity. That is, when the task is, I'm sure that you know this because your work is so complicated. When the task reaches a certain level of complexity, left hemisphere just cuts out. Says, this is too complicated, I can't deal with it. But apparently, the right hemisphere, because it deals with stuff simultaneously, visually, so that it doesn't have to use words strung out in strings, can deal with complexity. So for example, in doing this drawing, left hemisphere faced with all of this complex detail, say the collar and that bow tie, would say in effect, listen, if you think we're going to draw all that stuff, forget it. And if you want bow tie, here it is, da, 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 that's it, that's good enough. But apparently, the right hemisphere is willing to accept complexity of unlimited quantity. Now, one reason it can do this, I think, is that it has no sense of time. It cannot keep track of time. 
whereas the left hemisphere does keep track of time and will say things, you know, this is going to take forever, and I, you know, I've, I've got to catch the bus, and so on. Uh, so when, I'm sure that many of you have found yourself working on a complicated problem, a drawing problem perhaps, uh, right through the night, you, you, you finish the drawing, you realize that it's 4.30 and you've got to get up at 7.30 to, uh, to get to class or whatever. Um, but I'm sure that you're also aware that you do not get tired. Right hemisphere apparently lacks the ability to be bored. It, uh, if you're working in R mode, deeply in R mode for long periods of time, you end up feeling not tired, but invigorated. Very, so you're you know, raring to go at 4.30. Uh, R mode has some other wonderful characteristics. One feels um, self-confident. One feels up to the task. One is enjoying what one is doing, is perfectly concentrated on the task. It, this is not a state of daydreaming. That's another state of consciousness. This is a highly alert state, which can be maintained for hours if the phone doesn't ring. If the phone rings, forget it. Or if someone calls you from the next room, it will pull you out of our mode. You get very angry, don't you? You say, what? What do you want? And you don't hear the words, really. You do not decode the words. You just are aware that someone has pulled you out of this wonderful uh, R mode. Now, um, in our classes at the university, we, we try, when the students are drawing, not to talk at all uh, in order not to pull people out of R mode. And this produces a wonderful silence in the room. Some of our teachers use music to increase the uh, depth of our mode. But I recommend that to you. I really do believe this is why so much creative work is done alone. Talking destroys our mode. Talking pulls you out of our mode, I should put. The next slide, then, is a, uh, a slide from one of our oh, sorry, recent students also a pre-instruction drawing, uh, again reflecting an L-mode response to drawing a person. A, a post-instruction drawing uh, by the same student of one of the, of the, one of the students modeling. Another pre-instruction drawing by a student who was not an art major, and a post-instruction drawing by the same student, a self-portrait by the same student. Now these are the semester classes. We go for about 14 weeks of instruction, meeting twice a week, one for lecture and one, one for studio. A pre-instruction <laughs> pre drawing by a 35-year-old lawyer. Lawyers are the worst, we've decided. <laughs> Lawyers are getting a very bad rap these days. But it's true, I mean, this man was, has been fully awarded by our culture in all of the ways that we can reward in terms of salary, prestige, and so on. He's drawing on about age level four or five. And this, uh, what we might call a learning disability, would never have been discovered had he not come into a class. But he did, he did very well and uh, did this drawing five weeks later of a fellow student. The Next drawing, also pre-instruction drawing by a non-art major, per perhaps a business student or engineering student, and a post-instruction self-portrait uh, done uh, after midterm, probably at, at around 12 weeks. The next drawing, this is by one of our art majors, coming in with skills about high school level, drawing pretty well, but these students also improve their skills uh, these are percept we teach only perceptual skills. We do not teach drawing techniques per se, but only how to see what's out there in front of your eyes all the time anyway in, in, in order to, to see, how to see in order to draw. How to see is really what drawing is. 
Uh, there's a saying in the art biz that uh, if you can teach a person how to see, that person is then able to draw. If you do not learn drawing, believe me, you learn to see what is out there that very often the brain will not let you see because it's processing in a verbal, by naming, in a verbal, symbolic way. And I'm sure that those of you taking drawing have felt your hand being forced to do things that you know you don't want to put into your drawing because L mode uh, is still in control. In order to draw, it's necessary to set the left hemisphere aside. This last set of pre-instruction drawing by, again, a non-art major. I, I should mention that, that we, as art teachers, love this drawing. We thought it was amusing and original and uh, conceptually strong and so on. And perhaps you feel that way too. But the student hated it. He said, this is terrible. I'm still drawing the way I drew in junior high school. Won't you teach me how to draw? So we did, and this, and this is his post-instruction self-portrait. Now, and we, we were happy to see he didn't lose his sense of humor in this, <laughs> this portrait, the self-portrait with one eye is the title. Uh, now, the question comes up, what is it that these students learn and I've listed out here the perceptual skills that we teach. These are the basic component skills of drawing. It, it, drawing is a global skill, like uh, tennis or driving a car is a global skill, made up of component skills learned one at a time, that is in tennis you learn to serve, you learn to volley, you learn to where to place your feet, and so and then you put it all together into a global skill. Draw, that's what drawing is. It necessarily must be broken into its components, which then go on automatic, ideally. And the person then has this global skill where the components are so, uh, are on automatic. Uh, and we then say that person can draw. If, if you ask a person who knows how to draw, how does that person do it, they often say something like, well, I don't know, I just do it. Or I just look at the thing and I draw it. And this is, they say these things because if, it's very hard to put into words. My job in writing the first book was to somehow try to track what I was doing in drawing and to get that into words, to transfer it from this global automatic thing into linear words strung out in sentences. And I would find it goes through the brain so fast that it, I found that it was hard to slow down enough to then match this much slower system. The L mode is much slower, much more methodical, clearly, and it's very powerful because then it gets put into words, into a book, and is that can then be communicated uh, and learned, actually. So here we are, the perception of edges, where does one thing end and another thing begin? The perception of spaces, which is negative space. The per I'll show you examples of these in a moment. Perception of relationships, new learning for almost all of our students. And negative space is also new learning for most of our students. The perception of relationships is mind-bendingly difficult because it forces the students to deal with paradox. Now, paradox is very interesting. Paradox is deeply embedded in creative thinking. The fourth skill, the perception of lights and shadows, of the old method of light logic. And these methods that we use, listed on the far side, are, um, are the old methods, Nicolaitis's old methods of using, but coupled with information about the brain and giving the students capability to control their own brain 
ships, their own uh, Captain Kirk, Dr. Uh, McCoy, and Mr. Spock. The final skill, the perception of the, what we call the gestalt, we really do not teach. It really has to do with the perception of the, what we call the thingness of the thing, or to the uh, character, the personality of the sitter, the, um, the, some awareness that all of these things that you're drawing add up to something more than the parts themselves. So if we go back then to this drawing, what between this drawing and this drawing, what the student learned was how to see edges, not as stereotype, you know, this is a hat, but the complicated edges that are really out there in all their complexity. He learned to see spaces, um, to see the spaces around, but also spaces within, or for example, we use the whites of the eyes as negative spaces, to see relationships, how, how big is this relative to this, how wide is this form relative to this form? What is this angle relative to the edges of the paper? And so on. Uh, he learned to see lights and shadows. What is the shape of this shadow? And what is the shape of this lighted area? Finally, he sees himself. And somehow in the drawing, this deeper perception, which gives rise, really, to a kind of sense of wonder about things out there in the real world, which gets plugged into the drawing, the crinkling of the hat, and so on, is, is uh, what finally causes this sense of finally seeing something at last. And this is a, a wonderful experience. I think uh, certainly all of our school children should surely have this experience to draw anything, a crumpled up piece of paper, an old shoe, and to fall into this wondrous sense of the complexity, of really falling in love with that thing. We always warn our students, if they draw someone's portrait, they better watch out, because they're going to fall in love with that person. And our students do report that Having learned to draw, they find life is much richer, that they're seeing much more, that, uh, that they, they had no idea there was so much out there. And we often ask them, well, what were you seeing before you learned to draw? And they often think, and they say, well, uh, I think I was just naming things. Left hemisphere is on. And it says, yes, this is a guy wearing a hat. Dismissed. Yes, that's a flower, it's a marigold, can't you see? Dismiss. Yes, that's an old person. Dismiss. And so on. Things divided into verbal categories and dismiss. But in drawing, one learns to understand something. You, you gain an, a, an understanding. Uh, I could see from the, the really lovely first semester figure drawing that you're gaining an understanding of how the figure is put together and how complicated it is and how beautiful it is and so on. Whereas in another, another person walking in would say, well, you know, it's just a pregnant woman or whatever. So this, I think, is the big advantage of drawing. Um, a, one of the great advantages of drawing. Now, I've come now to my main message of this, uh, of this part of my lecture. Because the nitty gritty question, the Captain Kirk question is, how do, you, how do you then manipulate your own brain? Well, I think that this is the strategy, or in psychology it's called a model. But what you do in order to access subdominant R mode, visual perceptual mode, of the brain, it is necessary to present your own brain with a job that your left brain will turn down. 
I'll say that again. In order to gain access to this subdominant, very fragile, ephemeral, fleeting, nonverbal, and in that sense, less powerful way of thinking, that 50% of one's brain, it is necessary to present your own brain to make a de conscious decision to present your own brain with a job that your left brain, Mr. Spock, will turn down. Okay? Now, I'll give you an example out of ordinary life. Freeway driving. How many of you do a lot of creative thinking on our freeways? How many of you have gone right past your destination and didn't even know it? <laughs> Now, if you think about it, freeway driving requires visual perceptual processing, very rapid. If you were doing this, if you were driving in L mode, you have to talk your way through this. Now the Cadillac is approaching at 60 miles per hour, will overtake in 4.2 seconds now. And just, you can see that, as to try to string those sentences up, the situation in this moving traffic has already changed and the information is no good. Now, L mode, which is aggressive and dominant and will almost never admit that there's something it can't do, and it's lying most of the time anyway, we all know this, says in effect, I don't like to drive. We'll let old stupid do it. I'll take a little nap goes into alpha, goes, quote, down, gets out of the job. Our mode, which is capable of processing all of this rapidly moving visual information and of going to work on creative problem solving at the same time, takes over and uh, uh, all goes well. Now, most of you know we all drive alone. It's my feeling that this, is, this pleasurable state of our mode is why carpooling will never work. <laughs> because no one wants to talk while driving. You're doing all this stuff, it's on automatic, and you're able to do creative problem solving in this wonderful state. Now, if we go back to our, the skills that we teach, the same model prevails, prevails. We teach the perception of edges by forcing our students to draw so slowly and in such detail that the left hemisphere, I think, is bored out of the job. Says, if you're gonna do all that stuff, forget, I'll show you an example of this. I think I'll, I'll move on to the examples of this. This is an example of pure contour drawing drawn by a student looking at the wrinkles in the palm of the hand. Now, as a friend of mine, said on seeing one of these drawings for the first time, she said, no one in the left mind would do a drawing like that. <laughs> and this is true. L, L mode will not do this. Says this is really stupid. It's just boring. Great. It bows out of the job just what we want. And the person then can see all this complex material. From there, we go directly into contour drawing where now the student is able to control brain shifts and is capable of working with this very complex material. We next go to negative space. The left hemisphere likes to name objects. This is a chair, this is a podium, a, a stage, and so on. Left hemisphere finding you, gazing, and trying to process spaces like this says, in effect, I do not deal with nothing. And if you're going to look at that stuff, forget it, I'm out of it, I don't like to do that. Well, terrific, this is just what we want. The left hemisphere bows out and the person then now can see and can set down in a drawing in negative space. This is a cartoon on sighting, which I'm very fond of, actually, but other people don't seem to find it. Uh, that appealing. This, these are the Egyptians citing the, uh, the uh, side view. In terms 
of citing, we get our students to processing paradoxical information by the old method of holding up a pencil and taking sights. Now the problem here is that left hemisphere says, listen, don't tell me that that ceiling goes off at those funny angles because I know it's flat and you better draw it flat. Don't tell me that this floor comes to a point at the end because I know it's parallel and so on. So left hemisphere, finding you dealing with paradox, which it will not deal with, bows out of the job, I think. But this is the hardest one to get it out of, so it's always the hardest one to teach. Uh, in a paradoxical drawing like this, uh, left hemisphere says, in effect, don't tell me that the lower leg is only two inches long because I know better. And you'd better draw that whole thing out there. Laurel was it dealt with the foreshortened form on the model uh, in her drawing that's posted. And this causes great mental distress, right, Laura, in doing foreshortening. So you have to get L mode out of the job, then just draw what you see, then you can draw. Just what you see, not what you know, quote, know conceptually, and then you can draw. Then we have our students working with light shadow. Again, uh, this information apparently is not useful to the left hemisphere. It does not name it or categorize it. The shapes that are drawn, for example, the eye shape over here is not, does not fit the symbolic shape of eye. And again, apparently, L mode drops out of the job. So our strategies in teaching drawing fit with that model. I believe that that's the correct model. That if you want to enter our mode, you must, as Captain Kirk, present your brain with a job that L mode will turn down. Now sometimes if the brain has gotten itself trained up, if you have trained your brain just to start drawing will cause L mode to drop out. But I reiterate, in architecture, you guys have got to keep, and women, I call both men and women guys these days, you guys have to keep both modes going at once. And this, I think, is very hard. Somehow, I think, uh, perhaps what attracts people to the field is the ability to double track. Uh, Linda Jo tells me that, that, that Dean is really good at this. For an artist often, it, that is in uh, painting and drawing, that may be a person who's single track, who really gets into R mode and cannot keep the L mode stuff in mind as time goes on. But the brain is very malleable. You can, by making, again, a Captain Kirk decision, you can decide how your brain is going to behave. And when it's appropriate to bring both modes together, you can do that too in a cooperative way, not so much in a competitive way. So that's it. The, the next drawing out, we ask our students to do a profile drawing. This comes well before midterm. And from there, we go into portrait drawing. Now, the reason we use portrait drawing is that the symbol system for a portrait is so strong coming out of childhood drawing. And I want to address that next. Those symbols, each, each one of us has developed. Uh, I should stop for a moment and just ask if there are any questions on all that. Any questions that have occurred to you? Yes, please. No, they sit in front of mirrors. We, we, we tried, they use mirrors. We, we discourage our students from using photographic materials, although drawing is always the same task. You're always using the same skills no matter what kind of drawing you're doing. Uh, that is to draw perceived objects. So whether it's a photograph or your image in the mirror, you're still using the same skills. But it's easier to draw the photograph because the third dimension has been taken out of it. For that reason, we encourage our students to try for the hardest. 
we, we put our students directly into what they feel is the hardest, to draw a portrait from life and get a likeness. Yes? Oh, I'm sorry. The yes, right. Uh huh. <laughs> oh, I see what you're saying. Well, you know, most people who draw do close one eye part of the time in order to remove the third dimension, to flatten the image. This is, you often see people, half the time, perhaps, closing one eye to, you know, try to deal with the third dimension. Absolutely right. Any other questions on all of that? Yes, last question. We'll go on. Oh, I'm so glad you asked the question. The question is, what about the trained hand as opposed to the trained brain? Uh, you know, a lot of people feel that they can't draw, they say, because um, I, I, I don't have the eye-hand coordination for it, or however they put it. But there's very little hand coordination or hand training involved in drawing. It's almost entirely training the visual system to see. Now we know this because a person who can see, say a, a handicapped person, without the use of hands can, can draw using, the, by holding the pencil in the teeth, in the toes, under the armpit, whatever. It's not manual dexterity. And the hand, I suppose, gets trained somewhat. But drawing is mostly dependent on being able to see. What's that? To see in these special ways and to be able to see, again, what's really out there, which is what I'm coming to next. Also, talent, I think, is not an issue. But what we call talent is, you know, it's a, just an excuse. <laughs> The, the function for drawing is there in the brain, really. I'm not talking about art. I'm just talking about the learning the basic skill of adult level drawing. Is there one more question? And we'll go. Can a blind person draw? You know, several people have asked me that question, but I personally have never worked with the blind. So I, I don't know, and it would be, depend a lot on when that person became blind and a lot of uh, things that are way out of my field, so I just can't address that. Now, the drawings that you're seeing are childhood drawings. I'm sure you all remember your, your kid drawing, your kid landscape. Uh, as time goes on, each person develops a set of symbols which they use consistently as this child used the same symbol for I for each of the figures going across used he over here for the cat's eyes. Same symbol is used for the hands on each of the figures and over here becomes the cat's paws or hands for the cat. Um, and this, this set of symbols is memorized like the alphabet really and can be combined and recombined by the child, each of us did this, each of us developed our own symbol system so that perhaps a teacher or other kids could recognize our drawings uh, as, a, as being uh, uniquely ours. As is shown in this next cartoon, the teacher is saying, you must be Billy's parents, I'd recognize you anywhere. <laughs> Now the symbol, the symbol, <laughs> the symbol system for uh, 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 that are used used by children lasts for a while up until about junior high school. At which point, children often begin to do this kind of cartoon-like. Teachers hate these drawings, and I should add that the level of taste at this point is at an all-time low. You know. 
But you can see that this student at junior high school level is trying to do shading, is trying to make things look real. And um, uh, if taught at this point, we'll go on drawing. If not, we'll very likely decide at the end of a session, or a few years of cartooning, cannot solve the problems of drawing, cannot overcome the brain's propensity to change information out there and not let us into what it's doing, cannot draw, and will give up drawing forever. Now, we, I want to mention to you, because it's enclosed in your packet, a little exercise that I invite you to do if you have never drawn upside down. This fits the model that our strategy, our major strategy, because apparently the left hemisphere will not deal with upside down information, finds it difficult to name and categorize things that are seen upside down. So the first week our students come in, we ask them to copy the Picasso drawing, and I invite you to do this when you have uh, a half hour free, we won't have time to do that tonight, to copy the drawing upside down. If you're having any doubts about your drawing skills, this should convince you that the function for drawing is in the brain right now, if only we can get at it. Now, I, when we have our students do this the first day, they can't draw lick, really. We put the drawings up, Every person in this room or in our classes will have done a good copy of the Picasso drawing. Uh, now, this goes against common sense, that it's easier to draw upside down than it is right side up. But let me show you an example of a student who misunderstood the instructions. He did this right side up. And you can almost hear the left hemisphere talking. Right, here's this guy, he's wearing glasses. We've got a symbol for glasses, okay? He's sitting on a chair, we can do that. And we'll, we'll just leave the hands off because hands are hard to draw. <laughs> so this student came in the next day and I said to him, listen, you have misunderstood and gave him the upside down drawing instructions. And the next day, this student did this drawing upside down. Now there's no way that you can get from here to here in one day. And no matter how good the instruction is, there's no way it can be that fast. So the inescapable conclusion has got to be that if you set up the conditions that cause this shift into the brain mode that is appropriate for drawing, you can draw. Those functions are there in the brain right now if we can only get at them. And what we teach our students to do is to get at them. Now, I'm sure that in your, I'm hopeful at least because I don't know your field that well, that you are making the applications in architecture and in design. What are the, what, what are the ways that you can achieve access to our mode within the tasks that require it in your field? What are the combinations within architecture or within the design for keeping the ELMO, the numbers, the requirements, the budget, the timeline in mind while the creative stuff proceeds? Or conversely, how can we set aside that stuff now and do purely creative problem solving and then go back and meld those two ways of thinking, those two parts of the problem together. Now, if you want to try this, uh, ups the effect of upside down, if I point out to you that this tree and this tree are the same size, most people find that hard to believe. But if I turn this slide upside down, most people find that information, that this tree and this tree are the same size, to be more accessible. But if I go back now to the original right side up, that tree grows again. Now this is an example, if we go upside down, you'll see that you can now see it, and now you can't. 
Now this is an example of the kind of changes that the brain makes without telling us what it's doing. And our techniques of teaching help the student to pull aside that curtain to get beyond what the brain is doing to see what's really out there in order to draw, especially for perspective drawing, this is really necessary. Uh, as another example of how the brain lights on something, this famous image, which can be described as either a young girl or can be seen with equal validity as an old hag. Either as a young girl or as an old hag. Men usually see the young girl first. And I regret to tell you that this drawing is known as the wife and mistress drawing. I felt, I, I, I felt constrained to do a husband and lover over here to even, even things up. Can you see both images? It's excruciating if you can't. But I, I do think that if you have not seen both images, the kind of questing that your brain is doing right now to find the second image is what goes on in creative problem solving, which we're just about to get to. We'll hear the ahas, right. Aha, right. That a question is asked, the research is done, and the problem is solved. I'll leave it up for a minute because it's just excruciating if you can't see them both. Yes, we're still hearing the ahas. <laughs> okay, I hate to take this off because if there is, is there anyone who hasn't seen them all? All four. I'm sorry. I'm going to do it to you. But uh, this is this is a very interesting. But given a problem that grabs you in creative problem solving, this I think is exactly what happens. Given a problem that's grabbing, you can't let go of it until you get the answer, and then you have such relief when standing in the shower, the aha comes. Now, this, as you see, this slide is beamed at business problem solving, but it really has to do with artistic problem solving uh, or any other kind of problem solving. That I'm suggesting that having learned visual perceptual skills, that one can use these strategies to set L mode aside and then see problems in new ways to see the edges of problems. Where does one thing end and another thing begin? For example, where do the client's needs for budget control end and the artist's or architect's or designer's need, aesthetic needs, where do those things come together at an edge? And what is that edge really like and how complicated is it? What lies in the negative space of a problem? You, you see the objects, Americans, we tend all to see we are, we are, quote, objective. But other cultures, the Japanese, for example, are very good at seeing what they call what lies in the space of a problem, in the space around a problem. And often it takes a very uh, strong effort to turn one's attention, not to the object, but to the space around, and what lies in that space. How big is that space? Is it cluttered up with things? Or is it empty and endless, and so on? What are the relationships in this problem? How big is the client's budgetary need with the, uh, as compared to the artist's aesthetic needs. What are the constants in this problem? Time is a constant always. Money is often a constant in the sorts of problems that you deal with. 
And that can you see things against these constants in order to assess what the angles are and what the proportions are? What are the lights and shadows of the problem? What is in the light right now that you know about this problem, but what lies in the shadow? And can you extrapolate from what you know and can see into learning, as one learns to do in drawing, into seeing what's in the shadow of the problem? Often, for example, it, a problem is presented, and it's only much later that you find out that in the shadow may lie something as bizarre as the fact that the client is, the client's wife is the one who's making all the decisions in the in the problem. And it's very, it's very, a very important skill to be able to see into the shadows even when uh, things have not been made explicit. And finally, to see the problem as it really is, not what you have decided it is, but to part that curtain, to see through that dark glass to what is really out there, what, what is truly in front of your eyes, we hope, and is waiting to be seen. I think that these perceptual skills apply very, from the history of creativity, they apparently apply directly to problem solving. This is an example of Elmo thinking, the woman is saying, I'm leaving out the cows, there are just too many of them. And this is the problem with the client. The man behind the desk is saying, that should take care of any more brilliant ideas emanating from the right hemisphere of your brain. <laughs> now, often when I've talked with the architects and designers in the past, I've been struck by the fact that the, in question and answer time, that many of the questions have to do with, how do I get the client into our mode? I don't have that much problem with our mode. It's my clients who need to be able to shift into our mode to see the aesthetics of the problem. And I, I have found in talking with architects and designers that one of the best ways is simply to stop talking and start drawing for them, hopefully, ideally upside down for them, <laughs> you see. So that, that you will kick them into our mode. If you're going to ask them to choose colors, for example, you, you don't want to have them naming colors. You get them to point at colors. <laughs> Try to get language out of the thing and keep it out for long enough to get that client into our mode. They will be much more loving, much more cooperative, much more sharing, and much more appreciative of, they'll have gotten off the bottom line, in other words, and onto the aesthetics of the problem. Now, finally, in these slides, and before we go to the creativity work, I hope we'll have enough time for If you're willing to stay, stick with me for another you know, about 25, 35 minutes, is the aspect of the stages of creativity. The first slide shows, oh, I'm doing that backwards, sorry. The, in 18th, 19th century, three stages were known. In the 20th century, in the, again, in the late 19th century, the fourth stage was added. I've got to skip over this without it. One there, and finally, oh, where is it? I'm sorry. The, oh, sorry, apparently, that, that we now know there's a, for a, a third slide showing five stages of creativity. And they, uh, there's one that was added at the front called First Insight, in which a question is asked. Now, the exercises that we're doing have to do only with that first stage. And I'm going to describe these stages, even though the, in this slide the first stage is missing. If you can imagine a number one, saturation is two, Incubation is three, the aha is four, and finally verification is five. And you'll all recognize this process. In the first stage, you're looking around, uh, the mind is wandering, a la Arietti, and you notice something. 
that strikes you. Something's missing, something doesn't fit, there, uh, uh, something looks funny to you, and you say to yourself, you ask a question. The question usually goes, I wonder if, dot, 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 I wonder why, dot, 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 I wonder whether, or I wonder how come, dot, dot, dot. And that is the first step towards a creative solution. Now, that first step is very creative. Einstein said that to ask a creative question is as creative as finding the solution to a problem. To do that, one must be always alert to possible questions, I think. To increase your creativity, to, I think it's important to be asking more questions and to be looking for questions. Uh, someone, a, a, a professor at Caltech who has won two Nobels was asked, how is it that you've done so much creative work? And the answer was, from this guy, I'm always looking for things that don't fit, he said. And when I find something that doesn't fit or something's missing, I know I'm on to something. It's like that. That's the first step, just to ask a question, which is as far as we'll get tonight, I'm sure. Once the question is asked, then it's necessary to do the research, to saturate the brain with all the information, as much as possible, that's known about that question. I mean, you don't want to be reinventing the wheel, so you want to find out what other people have done in this area and if the question was ever answered. So you saturate the mind with information. Yes. But, oh, I see what you're saying. Yes, but uh, what I'm saying, uh, I'm sorry, but the objection is that someone has said that to ask a question is to focus the mind, and therefore this is contradictory to what I said about letting the mind wander. But what I am saying, really, is that in order to ask that focusing question, that before that, and during any free time one ever has, one wants to be letting the mind rove over whatever is happening in front of you. And this often gives the impression that this person is, you know, just wandering and so on. But I think it's not that. But the question does focus the mind now. And it also focuses the research and the saturation to find as much information as possible. Now, towards the end of that second stage, anxiety sets in. You remember that, don't you? The question is not answered. You've done all that work. Maybe you've worked for a year on this problem. You can't find the answer to this question. At that point, fed up, you say, one says, right, I can't get it. I've worked on it, maybe there is no answer. I'm fed up with thinking about it, I'm tired of it, I'm going on vacation. And in going on vacation, apparently that's a kind of programming of the brain to take, to begin the third stage, the least understood stage of creativity called incubation. During which I think the brain if you can conjure with this notion, that the brain, saturated with information, guided by the question, goes to work on the problem on its own, while the person does something else. How many of you agree with me on that? This is a wild notion. I mean, it brings up serious problems about who's in charge here and free will and a lot of, but I think this is what happens and it fits the history of research and apparently a lot of you accept that notion that the brain is working on the problem on its own 
And then I think what happens is that it's rotating all this information in a visual space, looking for best fit, looking for how the parts fit together, looking for the underlying pattern that will provide the organizing principle, looking for the key that unlocks. And when it finds that key, we come to that the great aha, that wonderful moment that can occur at any odd moment. Standing in the shower, driving on the freeway, uh, sitting in the bathtub, gardening, jogging, listening to a lecture, right? Exactly so. In conversation with a friend, as has happened, in fact, in creativity. Sorry? It seems to take place randomly. You know, there's a famous story of uh, Poincaré that, who was working on the problem of the Fuchsian formulas, was fed up, tired, went on vacation, was in conversation with a friend, and as the story goes, he says, he wrote, as I placed my foot on the second step of the tram, the answer came to me. He said, I continued in conversation with my friend, though I was so excited. And when I went home that night, I wrote it all down. And this seems to be the way it happens. It comes at unexpected moments, feels right, fits all the requirements set up by the question and the research, feels right, is right, gives us tremendous sense of joy, as Einstein said about his great discovery of the relativity formula, that when the answer came to him, it was the happiest moment of his life. Yes. I have heard about that, and I've also read that they often program themselves, back to Captain Kirk, to find the song, and then they go to sleep feeling confident that the brain will come up with the answer. And in fact, this again seems to be a characteristic of creativity, that a creative person has confidence that the brain will find the answer. As Amy Lowell said at one point, uh, if she got in trouble with the poem, she said, I just drop the problem in the mailbox and wait for the answer by return post, as she put it. Or Norman Mailer once said that if he got in trouble with a pot, that he said, I make an appointment with my brain <clears throat> for noon the next day, and it brings me the answer, and so on. So that it seems to me that one, if one has confidence in this system, which can handle complex data of a complexity that would spin out left brain, to program it into the brain with instructions, right, I can't find the problem, I can't find the answer, you find it. With confidence, and make an appointment, why not? By return post. With confidence that the brain can do that, and wait. Now that doesn't mean that you can get away with not doing saturation, with not having anxiety, I guarantee, that anxiety is part of the problem, is part of the process, I should say. You're going to have anxiety, I'm going to have anxiety, and probably terrible anxiety. And that seems to be a necessary aspect. Some confidence that the brain will deal with it and will provide us with the great aha. And then, finally, the problem must be validated. The building must be designed. The interior must be set down on paper. The budget has got to be. All of those validating things must carry. Otherwise, the process is incomplete. Having been given the insight, it is the person's responsibility then to carry through the really ghastly work that it often is to validate that inside. And this is not validation in the sense of uh, validation from the public, but validation of the process.
which I, I think goes back to Ariete, who ended his little set of unwelcome characteristics by reminding us that creativity requires discipline. You know, creativity is often thought to be kind of fun and uh, amusing, and to be creative is thought to be often happy and so on, but it's, I think it is not. The history of creativity indicates that it is not, that it, it, often it's a lot of hard work, uh, ghastly hard work, but uh, the moment of insight and the seeing of the project uh, being validated, I think it provides its own inherent uh, reward that it seems to be sufficient for most of us, at least. Now, I want to go to the overhead projector. We're just going to be doing some of the little creativity exercises. So I think we'll have the lights up then. And I've got to watch the cords here. I think Laura will take care of me. Okay, if you, you have some uh, okay, are you game for another half hour? Do you want to stand up and stretch for just a moment? Please do. I got myself set up here. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I, I think that Ariadne is dead right, yes, yes. I, I think it's 99% uh, perspiration, as a matter of fact, the way it's usually given. Oh, good, it's matching your experience then? Yes, yes. Yes, I know, I know. Write it on a piece of paper. If I should get on the other side. Okay, what you have produced is a drawing, of course. Can you all see me? I should probably stand on this side. Put that on the wrong side. We don't often think of our signatures as drawings, but in fact, it is a drawing. Using line, one of the by basic uh, elements of art itself. And this line can be read, if your signature belongs to you, my signature belongs to me as a legal uh, uh, object, actually, as a legal uh, uh, thing that I own. Because this signature comes out of my physiology, my culture, my training, my background, my personality, and yours the same. This is a drawing that expresses us. Someone else looking at this, quote, drawing, knows a lot about the person. Now, let's just experiment with that. Will you shift the pencil, if you're right-handed, shift to the left hand, and rewrite your name using your unusual hand. If you're left-handed, shift to the right. I'm so right-handed, I have hard time doing it. Okay. Now by, by simply shifting, by simply shifting hands, we have, each of us has produced a different drawing and I guarantee to you that I'm not going to get the job when I sign the application <laughs> with this signature because what now is communicated is a, how long you get, what is now communicated is a sense of tension, uh, uncertainty, uh, 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 perhaps uh, some kind of motor difficulty as well. All of these things. <laughs> okay, let's up the ante a little bit more. If you would cover these signatures now. And returning the pencil to the usual hand, 
Will you now write your signature, starting with the last letter, and it's going to look like your name always does, but you're going to write it backwards, starting with the last letter, and... Uh, I have a bit of trouble with the spelling myself. I've done this over and over, I still can't do it. Our left-handers will be much better at this than any of the rest of them. Okay, now again, you're going to find um, that the Andy has been up to bit, and very, very possibly your signature is deteriorating rapidly. Okay, let's do the last of these. Transfer back to the unusual hand. Cover what you have done. And if you would, please, again, write your name backwards with the unusual hand. <laughs> Here we go. And I think it's very instructive, along with this, to, to look at the signature, let me put this up at the top, of Georgia O'Keeffe, a great artist. Uh, this was her signature at age 91. This was her signature at 95. And this was her signature at 96. And my last signature looks quite a lot like, <laughs> like uh, this. So we read into the drawing, this last drawing that you did, we read into it a great uncertainty, great uh, uh, difficulty, uh, great tension in the line, um, and inabilities and so on. The same with Jeff Harris, his normal signature, his, this was written uh, with his left hand. He's pretty good going backwards, but this last one, as you can see, again deteriorated rapidly. Now from this we know, we can see, uh, you can see I hope, that signatures carry information. So if, for example, I give you a set of signatures, say John Jones, uh, this one, I misspelled his name, you know, we know something about this guy just from this. Is he extroverted or introverted? We could imagine what kind of car he drives. It's not a Dodge, I'm sure. <laughs> this John Jones. Would you lend him money? Would he repay you? Yes, he probably would. This John Jones. My students say about this when he rides a bus, he doesn't have a car. <laughs> or this one, this, this person. This one drives a Porsche, my students say. <laughs> so again, it's the same name, the same person doing the writing, but simply by changing the speed of the line, the uh, uh, shape of the letters, and so on, the reading of these signatures is different. And what you're responding to intuitively, it, you could, it's almost impossible to put this stuff into words. 
but because all of this stuff is so complicated. It's like watching the expression on someone's face. Uh, but we are reading this information. It's read in the right hemisphere. There's no question about it. Now, in addition, where is my little Maluma? In addition to... Oh, here we are. In addition to simply the letters and so on, we also read shape. In a very famous experiment, these two shapes were given two names, and I'll just put them side by side. Maluma and Tikati. And, uh, and large groups of people have been asked, of these two words, which would you apply to this shape and which would you apply to this shape? It's about 99.9% .9 of human beings apply maluma to which shape? That one, right. And, to, and then if you ask people why, they say, well, well, tell me why, why? All of that and, and more, no doubt about it. That it just fits. We know that it fits. So this language, then, we can regard. Can the great uh, Russian artist Kandinsky, in his uh, in his drawings, oh, I'm sorry, uh, use a pure language of line, a pure language of line, which is very sophisticated and deep and profound, nothing like Maluma and Tikati, but extremely complicated and deep. Now, I'm going to ask you to use the language of mine in your packet of papers. You've got a sheet of paper that looks like this. And I'm going to ask you to use the language of mine. I think we'll just do the top four and uh, with the idea that you could do the bottom four at some future date, but just to save time, we could take about four or five minutes, perhaps, to do these top uh, um, squares, drawings in these squares, and leave these for another time. Now, let me give you all of the instructions in doing this. I, we, incidentally, I have found that people who are untrained in drawing absolutely do not hesitate to do this kind of work. I mean, what you're going to be doing is really the very basis of art itself. It really is. The underlying structure, the communicating capability of line. But if I, if I go to work with business groups who don't draw at all, perhaps, most of them, they don't hesitate to do this. It seems to be a capability that human beings simply have. And they quite enjoy doing it. I think you will. So these are the instructions. Here you have four concepts, anger, joy, tranquility, and depression. And I'm going to ask you in each of these uh, rectangles, and I'll show you examples afterwards, but not before, to use only the language of line to set down an image that, for you, expresses these concepts. Now, there's only one restriction. You can use as many lines as you want. You can fill the whole square if you wish to. Use the side of the pencil, erase the line. Whatever you want to do with one restriction that you make no recognizable images whatsoever. No shooting stars, no daisies, no raindrops, no rainbows, no exclamation points, no symbols of any recognizable object whatsoever. Okay? Okay, go ahead. Now, let me say also that whatever you do is right because it feels right to you. There is no right or wrong, and every person will do a different drawing. Now, the way to do this is to think back to how you felt last time you were really angry. I mean, really angry. And without pre-planning what the drawing will look like, left brain likes to pre-plan, just don't plan it. And just as the, almost as though this emotion comes down the arm, out the point of the pencil, and you find yourself drawing something that 
feels right and keep drawing until it feels right to you. Then move to the next and the next and the next. Okay, we'll take about four or five minutes to do that. Now, since each drawing will be different, you needn't pay any attention to what the person next to you is doing because his or her drawing will be different. When you have finished those four drawings, will you just turn and compare with your neighbors what you got on those? You may not have finished all three, but just turn and compare. Now you will be able to read your neighbor's drawing. What you see is a picture of that person. show you, I'm going to run through these. Let me show you some, I'm just going to run through these uh, very rapidly just to show you some examples of student drawing. What we're looking at and what you have in front of you is a picture of, of you. That is what your anger is like, what this person anger, person's anger is like, and this person, and you'll notice that these drawings have a certain strange similarity, and yet also each is unique. Each is unique, and I would like next to show you, just to demonstrate that, you can see on your own drawing now what your anger looks like. If we, if I sh can show you, let me just get through there. If I can show you a collection of drawings of anger here. Now, what we see is that in this, in this language, there is a structural similarity, 
If you look on your own drawing, you'll find that you probably made darker lines and sharper angles for this than for uh, the square next to it. Within the, the structural similarity allows us to read the drawing in a general way. And in addition, we can read these lines specifically. So that if we look at these, each of these angers, we know somehow intuitively what this is like. This is certainly serious anger. You don't want this person angry at you. This, this person said he found himself actually stabbing the pencil through the paper. This anger, you know what this anger is like. This anger, this is the person who moves from subject to subject, saying, and another thing you do that I don't like. <laughs> And so on, this very stabbing anger. And if we look at a very large collection of these drawings, we find that the same thing, that structurally there is a similarity, but individually they differ, and each one can be read. So now if you look at your drawing of anger, or your neighbor's drawing of anger, that's what it's like. And one of the things that strikes me is, I'm sure that perhaps most of you didn't have any hesitancy about showing the drawings to the person sitting next to you. And what you realize, if you know that how revealing this language is, is that you sort of, you know, put your guts out there for someone else to see. And what we find that business groups are very uncautious, they're often, you know, how cautious business people are. In a, in a business setting, and they're very uncautious about sharing these drawings, and they really got to know each other better by doing these drawings. But my theory is that this fits the strategy that the left hemisphere thinks this is just doodling, and therefore it doesn't count. So if stuff comes pouring out on paper. Now what is the use of this? Well, the use of this is in problem solving. I, I should add that if we look into the history of art, we can find uh, reverberations of similar, this drawing by David Smith, the sculptor, and a second drawing by, by Jasper Johns have uh, uh, quite similar aspects. Also, a collection of drawings of joy. You'll find that your drawing it was probably a lighter and more rising, curving line. And here we have it, and a, an example of the language of joy. We see reminiscences in the Van Gogh drawing, this great joyful uh, uh, homage to a young tree. In your drawings of tranquility, how many of you used a horizontal line? Hands on that? I know, it's fantastic, isn't it? And uh, the thing is about these drawings that, in a way, it's so obvious. You know, and you say, well, of course it has to be horizontal. But it's not that obvious. Uh, and um, it allows us to read these as structurally similar but individually different, shown, used here in uh, the Dutch artist Van Roden and in this, this famous and, and yeah, very profound drawing by Rembrandt of the winter scene. I'll go, I'll go through just the uh, drawings of depression and then we'll move to the problem solving aspects of this. The drawings of depression seem to elicit falling lines, and to see a large collection of these is really startling. That depression is placed low in the format. And you ask students why they did that, and they say, well, you feel low when you're depressed. Or some students, and perhaps you did, I noticed a woman in front made this great fog of depression that fills everything. So there seem to be two major structural uh, uh, expressions, and yet each one is individual. Shown here, this famous sculpture uh, by James Earl Frazier. 
In depression, the line almost always moves from left to right and descend. If I have clocked this, you'll see that the reading is different. Now, it's my belief that underlying great works of art are these structures, as shown here in this uh, great etching by the Spanish artist Goya, in which these forms descend from left to right. The forms are placed low in the format, and he has added in this great fog of depression, uh, which we read melded to the image by this very great artist. Now, what is the use of this? I'll skip the bottom four of those squares. Well, this process can be used to do a portrait of somebody, specifically to do a portrait of you. I want to show you some drawings that we did in our seminar last summer. I should add at this point, I forgot to mention that that uh, we do a five-day seminar, that is uh, Linda Jo and our other three teachers and I do a five-day seminar in which I'm happy to say to you, we can teach our five perceptual skills in five days. This is known as our killer class. Uh, we work eight hours a day for five days and we can produce the kinds of changes that I showed to you tonight, which I think is a great tribute to the power of the right hemisphere to acquire uh, skills in a very, very short time. You can grasp and hold and acquire these skills. But these drawings, we added in, we did our five days at Harvard, as I say, last summer, and we added in a little work with creativity exercises in which we ended with, and I'd like to end this evening with, uh, with uh, the idea of drawing who am I want and a second set of drawings. Who am I? You can read these drawings. They're apparently read intuitively once the concept that line is expressive. Who am I and what do I want? And This person put the both drawings into one. This is who am I, and this is what do I want. <laughs> it's a wonderful creative response, I thought. This person did, oh, this is what do I, who am I, this is all of me, this person said. This is wonderful. <laughs> and. What do I want? This is very interesting to see these. I'm sorry we can't see these two together. Who am I and what do I want? And a further example of, I don't know which way this goes. Yes, this is the portrait. Who am I? Who am I? And what do I want? <laughs> this is so this is wonderful. They're so they're simply transparent, you know. I mean this woman wants a fling after all. <laughs> Got out of chintz and flowers. <laughs> and this